Coming up, the date is looming. Saquon Barkley and the contract decision. While it may be a foregone conclusion, he will be with the New York football giants. For how long is maybe the more intriguing and at what price point? We'll talk about that. Plus, a mysterious question about one Daniel Jones from Andrew Makowitz. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, my friends, it's OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where, of course, we are your host over here, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andrew Makowitz, and no time for pleasantries, Andrew, because the season wanes on the offseason, that is, and the contract for one Saquon Barkley looms large and ominous. Where do you stand right now on the Saquon Barkley contract in terms of how many years do you think it's going to be now? What do you think the price point's going to be? And ultimately, do you think that both sides are happy when this contract finally gets signed? Well, it sounds like, Adam, you're, you're kicking it off by being pretty confident that the deal will get done for the Giants. So, like, before we even get into the framework of it, like, mm -hmm. are you are you saying, like, it sounds like Saquon will be there one way or another, whether it's on the franchise tag or not. I think, first and foremost, we both agree that if a deal for some reason does not get done, you, you don't see a scenario where Saquon Barkley sits out the entire season, right? No, I would highly doubt it. I think so. If you let, let, we can start there if you want the hierarchy of outcomes. I think number one is that he gets signed and the contract is going to look like X. We'll get into that in a second. The second option would be that he they don't get to a contract agreement and he plays on the tag, but maybe as like the 2A, maybe he would actually try to go fine because they could pull that tag off of him and he could go in search of a contract somewhere else. Like maybe. And I'm sure his agent's doing the legwork. He's sniffing around to see, can I get a multi-year deal that, that gets me the bigger money, even if it's shorter-term contract from somewhere else that thinks they're a championship now team? Maybe that's in there. And then I think a distant, distance third is that he sits out. I just do not see the world where Saquon Barkley sits out a year. I don't think that it's going to change in a positive way where his market value would be another offseason from now when he could walk into free agency. Yeah, I just don't I just don't see a scenario where the Giants would rescind the tag because why why would they? What what's the what's the benefit for the Giant on the on the Giants side when they say 10 million in cash under contract? Sh sure. Uh, I, I mean, mean that that's can, the benefit. The yeah, the you know, brass tax benefit is you have money to go spend on somebody to your point. What for 10 million dollars are you adequately replacing the skill set and caliber of Saquon, which is to your point, right? Like why would we rescind something on a player that we don't think is ever going to sit out here this year? Yeah, I mean, I actually think in the hierarchy, it's more likely that he would get traded at that point than the Giants mm -hmm. just rescind the tag altogether. Because if there is multi-year deals out there for Saquon Barkley at the number that he wants, I'm sure someone would give up some compensation for it. I mean, look at Christian McCaffrey got traded midseason to San Francisco. If there's a team that thinks that they are one explosive playmaker away to give mm -hmm. up a second round pick or something for Saquon Barkley, maybe they would do it. So... I, I do think bonus that there caveat, are other bonus, bonus question here. Hold on. Bonus question. Um, trade deadline then. Say he's on the tag. Is Saquon Barkley, if Saquon Barkley enters the season on the tag, is it a guarantee that he plays the entire year with the Giants? Uh, that's a tough question. Because then where's the record, right? You get towards that deadline, where's the record, and, and how do we think things are going, right? Like, there has to at least be a world where the Giants would explore that, especially if Saquon's having another great start to his season, but the team isn't necessarily having success. Yeah, I, I would be of the mindset that you probably keep him through the deadline knowing that you're going to get a compensatory pick. It, sure. it would not sit well with the fan base to say that you traded off one of your best players if, if you're actually trying to build a team and win. Um, so I, I think the optics would look bad if Saquon Barkley were to ever get dealt in the middle of the season. But if he says he won't play on the tag and he says, I have other offers out there, then sure. I think the Giants have to actually take a hard look at saying, listen, we tried everything. We got to a number. We couldn't agree. He doesn't want to play on the tag. We have no other choices here. That is the only scenario outside of the multi-year deal that I think has legitimate legs.
Yeah, and I, I tend to agree with you because while I was going to say was, well, Joe Shane doesn't care about optics. You know what I mean? Like, really, he cares about building a team the right way. He's not concerned about dumping a bad contract, not showing a level of, you know, dedication or commitment to a player that was drafted by a previous regime. However, it would be a little bit different if you're talking about whether or not Saquon Barkley is a part of the long term future for the Giants. It would look different if midway through a season you're effectively saying, hey, this isn't quite going the way we had intended and we want to grab a little extra value on Saquon Barkley who we're not going to bring back. But that would still be like a partial indictment of everything, right? Because it's not while Saquon we feel like is a massive cog in the machine for this offense. If, the, if it had gone that poorly to the point where you were exploring trading Saquon, then you'd be saying, so what else didn't go well, right? Which one of these receivers that you brought in didn't work out? Was Waller not healthy all the way through? Was, you know, Daniel Jones, frankly, right? Was he not playing up to par with what you expected? Offensive line play, all those things. So I think it would open up a bit of a can of worms in that regard. So if then, let's do... <laughs> If then the contract does get signed, what is it? What's the years for you? What's the dollar amount? Because I have, I think in my head, the number that makes sense, but I'm curious if we line up. Okay. So there's a couple different ways that the Giants could tackle this depending on how they want to do things. So what I think is first interesting is I don't see it being a one-year deal because that's essentially what the franchise tag is. I don't right. necessarily see it being a two-year deal because we already know what the franchise tag is this year and next year for the Giants. They could just franchise them back-to-back -back years. Why would you do anything more than that if you weren't fully committed? So right. really for me, it, it's, it feels like it's either going to be a three-year or a four-year deal with Saquon. And Saquon Barkley is 26 years old right now. Three years would put him at 29. Four years would put him at 30. There aren't that many 30-year-old running backs in the NFL. But if there was anyone that could sustain it, it would be someone like Saquon Barkley, who is as explosive as he is. I, I think the I think it could end up being a three or four year deal, depending on what Joe Shane wants. I don't necessarily think it's about what Saquon wants. I think it's more about what Joe Shane wants. Obviously, Saquon Barkley cares about the guaranteed money. What is that number? We know over the next two years, it's about $22.5, $23 million that Saquon is guaranteed if he gets franchise tagged twice. So we know that the guarantees on the contract have to be more than $23 million, probably $25 million, has to start pushing upward. And I think Joe Shane may be able to move that up if he decides to go for a fourth year where he has the ability to move money around a little bit more to provide the Giants a little bit more flexibility. So I've always thought it was going to be a three-year deal at, you know, say 12 or 13, probably about $13 million a year. I'm now starting to think there could be a fourth year that allows more massaging of the numbers to benefit both Saquon Barkley getting more guaranteed money and the Giants with increased flexibility spread over a longer time horizon. Yeah, I mean, I... I... I agree with you. You brought up an interesting thing about like, what does Joe Shane want? Right. Cause it's not about what Saquon wants. I think what Joe Shane would love is franchise tag. You play on it this year and franchise tag. You play on it next year. And we never actually give you a contract. And then when you're about to be 28 years old, you know, we go, okay, why don't you go ahead and test free agency? Cause at that point it'll look a lot different. It's really hard, man. Like I was going and pulling up, you know, other salaries. It's like you think about a guy like Nick Chubb who's making 10 million right now. You think about you can go to a lot of different ways. Cap hit number, then the top hierarchy here is going to be Henry at 16, Chubb at 14, 8, Joe Mixon at 12, 7, Josh Jacobs at 10, Saquon Barkley 10. On the franchise tag, he's going to be there as a cap hit, the fifth highest paid player, tied for fourth highest player with Josh Jacobs, obviously on the tag as well. The base salary. He's going to be the fourth in the running back room because Nick Chubb and Derrick Henry, their base salaries are both rated right around $10 million. So to your point, if you want to structure it, you know, in a particular way, first of all, I cannot go four years. Now you can tell me that the fourth year is basically avoidable year and it means nothing. Okay. That's fine. Right. I can also go the route of give me an incentive based contract. That's fine for me too. Your base salary is effectively the franchise tag number around 10 million. We're going to give you a three-year deal worth guaranteed money, $30 million. And Saquon Barkley is going to say, but I can make 22 over the next day. Like, great, whatever. That, that's what the guarantee is. And then with incentives, 
You want to put it at clearing a thousand yards, something, something that signifies, by the way, not just statistically, but something that signifies to the Giants that this equates winning for us, right? And then you can go into the playoff scenario. Every playoff win that you go over 100 rushing yards or 100 total yards, whatever the numbers are, get me to 40 million over three years with all of those incentives. I don't think that Saquon Barkley cares about the incentives. He only cares about the guaranteed dollars as he should. But I don't think the Giants should be willing to go much beyond what the market value dictates. Because two years from now, you could have a much different looking player in your backfield. You could have drafted somebody. Another veteran could come on the market. I know how dynamic Saquon is. This is the hardest part because I'm not knocking Saquon Barkley. He's the exact player you want on the team, exact player you want representing your team. Unfortunately, you wanted him to be that guy when the Giants were winning football games over the past three, four seasons, not necessarily over the four going forward. It is. It is. You said that very eloquently Adam because it's like yes you want the 23 24 25 year old stud as you're ascending to the playoffs not the yeah. 27 28 bumping up against 30 years old when you're ready ready to go and it's no fault the Saquon it's just like it feels like timing wasn't there now what I will say is reports this week so Boomer Esiason from Boomer and Carton um came out this uh boomer you know, and geo respect week. that man's program how dare you boomer and geo yeah <laughs> look at that just just come well all the craig carton news about him moving on getting his own show is like in the back of my head but um yeah. so boomer and geo so boomer came on and said sources close to him who know saquon say that the negotiations have already restarted and it seems like a deal may get done around the 14 million dollar per year range didn't really talk about whether it was going to be three years or four years. Right. I mean, not, not knowing the guarantees three years at 14 million. How does that sit with you? I, I, I would, it's too much to me, right? Cause just look at the other contracts that by the time you're paying that you're potentially looking at and saying, Oh no, right. It's only an injury away. It's not too much based on the talent that is Saquon Barkley. It's just too much based on what the market is. The market's telling you, you don't have to pay him more than 10 or $11 million. So the extra 3 million a year, listen, let me, I'll walk it back a little bit. Can you symbolically give Saquon Barkley 14 million a year because of everything he represents right now for the organization? Yes. Am I going to be worried about it? Cause it's not my money. No. Do I think that going into next year and the year after, you'll look at that number and say, if not four, we could have. I think there's a world where that could potentially come up that way. Again, to your point, you tell me it's 14 million. So that's talking about 42 million over a three year contract potentially. If 7 million of that is in the incentive area, then again, that, that changes a little bit too, right? You can walk it down and say it's a two year out and maybe you only end up paying him. 26 instead of 22 on the two on the two um franchise tags okay right but I, this is the way joe shane is looking at it it's not just about the productivity it's also about the dollars and cents of it and understanding that saquon's not walking out into free agency and getting for he's not getting that money like that's the other thing too he's not getting that he is not going to free agency and getting 14 million dollars today it's not going to happen because nobody else has given anybody else that dalvin cook is walking around he was panhandling for a job like it's just not the way the market is right now. So you're only negotiating against yourself and against public perception of how it is to treat a player like this who's done everything right by the franchise. Yeah, I, you, you are spot on again. I don't think he gets 15 million on the open market. And if it was if it was dollar for dollar, like and he could go to, I don't know, the Houston Texans or something and get and get the money, like wouldn't you just want to stay in New York? Like he's right. from the area, like uh, doll apples to apples. Like he would end up wanting to stay. I think that the challenge is, you know, we've heard the number 12 and a half million be tossed around as like what the giants had on the table for him. My question is like, all right, if it locks him up for three more years and it's 13.5 million and we're talking about $1 million right. Right. like per year over it, like at some point you kind of got to just say, okay, like we got to just do this. And that that's kind of where the player gets the money that he desires and the team feels like they may have overspent just a little bit. That feels kind of like the sweet spot. But to your point, if he wants $15 million and you're talking about two, three, $4 million away from it, that's where yeah. in my mind it just feels like, okay, so you're going to be the second highest paid running back behind Christian McCaffrey when all these other contracts are coming in drastically lower. We just can't meet whatever the new, break the new market price is. 
Before we dive into this uh, Daniel Jones thing, my, my closing thought is, by the way, you pay him $15 million. And I go, good Lord, that seems like a lot. And the Giants win two rounds of the playoffs this year. Oh, you know, and then next year they go to the NFC Championship. Oh, and then in the final year, you know, they're pushing for the Super Bowl. Oh, you know, like it's all retrograde, right? Just like the Daniel Jones contract as we get into him now, right? Yeah, look at the contract. By the way, how did it break down? Where are the possible outs? Other contracts come in around the league. All of a sudden, Daniel Jones ends up kind of rating the range that you think he's probably deserving of. So it's all relative to production and results, right? And and Saquon has certainly showcased a lot of that early in his career. Now it's just about can he continue to show it at a high level? And ultimately, I think he's back, and that's a good thing, by the way. Like I'm for Saquon Barkley, never playing anywhere else and with the New York football. That's what I want. When we have these discussions, it's about trying to talk about the real world possibilities, not just my desire. It's, you know what it is? Pay him 20 million a year. What the hell do I care? I'm, I'm like, give, pay him 40 million. It doesn't matter to me. Pay him whatever he wants, John Mara. Like, I don't care, but there's always those constraints. Um, Daniel Jones wise, yep. get into it here with this. Yeah, go ahead. Well, final thing, just because yep. we'll do the final prediction. I think three years, 42 hmm. million with 30 million guaranteed feels like a good number where it's like, we're going to guarantee more than yep. two years, just a little bit more than that so yep. that it makes it seem fair. He gets more guaranteed than he would if he gets franchise tag twice, gets to stay with the team. The team gets a little bit of flexibility in year three if they need it out. That to me and, seems and, like the real deal. And I was going to say, it ends up being a two-year deal, $30 million, if it didn't work out and you want to cut that third one off, right? Like that would, to me, would make a lot of sense. Exactly. Yeah, I like that. I agree with it. So we're, we're lockstep there. Danny Dimes, hit me with it. Yeah, so obviously Daniel Jones got his shiny new contract over this offseason, yeah, which may or may not have imp impacted the ability to sign Saquon Barkley or make different moves that they've wanted to. And and so, Adam, I had this thought. Obviously, Daniel Jones making about $40 million is a significant investment by the Giants. It basically has him as a top 10 highest paid quarterback right now. You know, with, with some other deals like Burrow and Herbert that are coming down the line, he might move to about 12 at the, at the, at the furthest back. So, no, the Giants are paying him to be a top half, top third quarterback in the league, right? Mm -hmm. So that got me thinking, well, where does Vegas, who who knows a lot more than we do, have Daniel Jones listed in their odds to win MVP? So I will ask you, I did not tell you this beforehand. Where would you say um, from number one to 1,000, where, oh. where do they have Daniel Jones listed in terms of Best odds. odds for MVP. Best so like, odds for MVP. So like he's got to be Patrick Mahomes yeah. is number one, and obviously there's a couple other guys. Where would Daniel Jones fall in the pecking order? This is so interesting. On the one hand, I want to go a little bit higher because in theory, his him playing well and the team doing well. Would there, there be this one-to-one -one correlation around Daniel Jones gets the contract. Now, all of a sudden, the team plays really well, and he's at the center of it, so it could vault him. I don't know. I'll put a, I'm going to say nine, but I don't I, – I'm nine with a very shaky asterisk next to it. And by the way, my low ball was going to be something like 12 or 13. Wow. Uh, so Adam, number nine is Dak Prescott on the list. Uh, if you're just doing a list of, of who's there, um, he should be lower than Daniel Jones. is nowhere near. He is nowhere near where Daniel Jones is. Daniel Jones is the 24th Find who? highest odds. By fan, by FanDuel, a very reputable gambling. Site. No, no, I'm not saying I'm not. Yeah, I, I sorry, I didn't mean like by who. Yeah, by <laughs> FanDuel. Okay, fine. But then, because the other thing you said, and I didn't have the information, was then who's around him? He's 24th. So what does that like? What does that mean? I mean, wh where's Jimmy Garoppolo on this list? By the way. So, so th this is where you're going to get a kick out of it because where's it's Kirk not Cousins? just about where you are ranked. Like, yeah. obviously, well, yeah. What are the odds? Because find... the odds can be jammed up a little bit tighter in certain areas, right? Sure, sure. So. Josh Allen and Joe Burrow and Patrick Mahomes are all top three around seven to one, right? Right. That's about where the odds are. Then when you get to Dak Prescott at nine, you're talking about 16 to one. You know, you go further down the list, a couple more spots. Justin Fields is 20 to one. And so you then you have to keep scrolling past guys like, I don't know, Geno Smith, Jordan Love, Derek Carr, Kenny Pickett. You got to keep scrolling. Further and further down the list to get to Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones 
is 75 to one to win the MVP. And he is sandwiched between two players, Mac Jones and Ryan Tannehill. That is where Vegas sees Daniel Jones' ability to win the MVP. Does not but, does that not blow your mind? <laughs> I'll blow your mind. Of course it blows my mind. My mind is completely blown, Andrew. But by the way, um, I was over on so I put pu- I pulled up right now in real time Rotowire, which is sources, DraftKing, FanDuel, BetMGM, all these things, right? So I scroll down to see it, and they have him right now, uh, plus eight thousand, by the way, for Daniel Jones. And he's sandwiched between, like you said, Mac Jones just ahead of him, just behind him is Sam Darnold and th- and two spaces ahead of him is Trey Lance and Matthew, like Matthew Stafford. Okay, fine. Brock, by the way, let me put it this way. There are three quarterbacks on the San Francisco 49ers roster. Brock Purdy, who is five plus 5,000 for MVP. Trey Lance, who's plus 6,600 or 5,000 over on FanDuel. Keep it in the same range. Plus 4,000 for Brock Purdy. And then Sam Darnold is plus 10,000. Like, how could there be three quarterbacks on the same effing roster that have, two of them have a better chance? Now, again, that's results-oriented, the team being successful. A lot of this is predicated on what is the outlook for a particular team, right? Because you can't be in the MVP running if you're considered to be one of these back-end-of-the-league kind of rosters. But I'm having a really hard time that Kenny Pickett is also plus 4,000 for MVP odds. Kirk Cousins is plus 5,000 for MVP odds. I'm having a – yeah. This is disturbing. This is this is insane. Including Jordan Love, by the way, which no disrespect because I'm pretty high on him. I actually think he is going to be a good quarterback going forward. But how he gets thrust into that, predicated on where their team is and what their outlook is and where the Giants are, this yeah, there's objective insanity here. It it feels when I saw this, I immediately said to you like we have to have this discussion because to me that's crazy. He's he's right. Yeah, he's just in front of Kyler Murray, who's expected to miss like six to eight games of the regular season coming off an ACL injury. And to me, it's shocking because also, Adam, Daniel Jones has shown the ability to be a dual threat quarterback. He can rush the ball pretty successfully. He's got great athleticism and speed. He's going to score touchdowns on the ground. And if this passing attack continues to grow under Mike Kafka, like Daniel Jones's numbers can look pretty gaudy. They can they, they can start looking like what Jalen Hurts did, at, you know, as he jumped from year two to year three, three and so on and so forth. So, like, for me, it feels like Daniel Jones's ceiling is higher than some of these other guys. Like, it's it just blows my mind that Derek Carr is, like, significantly, like, more than Trevor Lawrence is 16 double, to 1. Like, the Trevor odds Lawrence of Daniel is 16 Jones to 1. It, it, it may, I don't like, sorry, I've been jumping all over you. Trevor Lawrence is 16 to one. And like, that's a really good comp for a very specific reason. Two teams weren't particularly good. Now Jaguars invested a lot of money in free agency to help ramp themselves back up around Trevor Lawrence, brought in a new head coach, obviously all of those things, but they've been building up around him. The Giants brought in a new GM, brought in a new head coach, brought in a new OC, brought in a new DC brought in a new infusion of talent. Like they are on very similar timelines and quarterbacks who, at least on statistics, you'd say, Hey, based on where you were drafted, you have a lot to prove here. And it's actually funny because I tried to pull up guys that were kind of in this range, which is like Jalen hurts and Justin Herbert. Trevor Lawrence has only played 34 games overall, but everybody else, Daniel Jones out of this group has actually played the most 54, but it's the idea that completion percentage wise, Daniel Jones would be second behind only Justin Herbert in the in these uh, categories here. Now, yards, passing yards per play, he's going to be the lowest. You mentioned rushing yards. Guess what? He averages more yards per rush than who? Jalen Hurts, 5.8. Daniel Jones is over top of a 5.2 Jalen Hurts right now. The rushing touchdowns are significantly in Jalen Hurts' favor. But to your point about being a dual threat quarterback, 1,700 yards that he's put on the ground here, it just... Hard for me. It's so hard. I'll tell you what, man. I'll close out on this idea. It's very hard for me to wrap my head around what is going on right now in the NFL perception-wise around the Giants. Because on the one hand, people are disgusted about what you're going to pay Daniel Jones, but they believe he has high upside. They believe that he took a big leap forward under Mike Kafka and Brian Dable, but they would never suggest that he could be in the MVP discussions. So it's like, how do you feel about Daniel Jones? How do you feel about the Giants team? How do you feel about the coaching staff? Brian Dable, like so many positive things are being attached to the New York Giants. And yet somehow 
the expectations for the team and even individuals seem to be starkly lower than where perception is right now. And that's probably a, a, an off season conversation here for like the giants and where they are as a franchise. At the end of the day, Adam, yeah. we yeah. have the reigning NFL coach of the year coaching yeah. Daniel Jones. You're expecting him to get better. He has the same offensive coordinator, Mike Kafka, who is interviewing for head coaching positions, considered a genius. You have supplemented the wide receiving core. You have gotten guys like Jalen Hyatt. You're going to be getting Wandale Robinson back. You got a midseason acquisition, um, you know, halfway halfway through the season to, to solidify everything with Isaiah Hodgins. Like, there are so many moves that have been made. We expect Saquon Barkley back. It is baffling to me that the needle is pointing up on Saquon when, when Vegas is telling you, no, there's no upside there whatsoever. To me, yeah. it's just confounding. The fact that, Jay, that Justin Fields is in the top 10 in terms of the most likely and Daniel Jones yeah. is 24th, that to me just doesn't compute, especially given that the Chicago Bears are not even expected to be as good as the Giants. So for me, I feel like I'm lost. I've missed something. I don't really understand what's happening with Vegas and what they think the Giants are capable of, specifically Daniel Jones this year. And I'll give I'll give the Chicago Bears the mild pass of what is that division going to look like? But Justin Fields being at twenty to one is, is pretty is pretty upsetting to me. Uh, I'll go ahead and leave it that Jordan Love, Kenny Pickett, and Mac Jones those are the ones that really make me violently upset. If we're going to talk about where you're putting MVP chances and odds here, we'll continue to talk about this in the offseason. Though, which by the way will include a deeper dive on Daniel Jones and expectations, maybe a little redraft. Where would teams stand a few years after Daniel Jones has been in the league and the potential? of what he was as the sixth overall pick in the NFL draft for the New York Football Giants. You always get us on YouTube, obviously, at One Giant Podcast, over on Twitter at One Giant Podcast, at AndyMac214, at Adam Armbrecht. We thank you always as making us a, a part of your daily routine or weekly routine in this offseason. We'll continue to bring you the Giants content as Andy Mack, which would want, need, and nay, demand the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue. <laughs>